Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and today we're going to be talking about the Maxwell distribution of speeds for gases. Uh, in order to discuss this, we're going to refresh a little bit about what is a Boltzmann distribution. Uh, this typically comes from statistical thermodynamics, where um, in my course, sometimes we don't have enough time to get to that point, but we, this is important when it comes to talk about the distribution of speeds, which ends up being on a lot of physical chemistry um, examinations at the end of the year. So let's talk about the Maxwell distribution. If I can find my piece of chalk, there we go. The speeds. So Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. talking about the Maxwell distribution of speeds of different gas particles as they start to oscillate around. So the individual speed speeds. We're going to give it the symbol nu following the Atkins uh, book of gas particles. spans a wide range because not all the big gas particles are moving at the same rate. Some are bumping into the wall, which means they're moving at a bit different rate. They're smacking into each other. So we get a distribution of speeds. So the individual speeds of gas particles span a wide distribution due to the collisions. Collision. And this leads to a distribution of speeds. Or kinetic energy or energy in this case. That's really what we're talking about. And we talk about this distribution, uh, we give it the symbol F of nu. So when we're talking about a distribution, most of the time we're talking about a Boltzmann distribution. And really what we're considering is differences in energies. So this falls out of stat mech if you're interested in that. Um, hopefully I'll have another video later on. You can check in your books on how this comes about. But the formula for calculating different populations of particles in different energetic states is as follows. So the formula for calculating Relative populations of states is called a Boltzmann distribution. And uh, we're going to consider a ratio. So we have particles. The number of particles in some state, we're going to call it n sub i, divided by the number of particles in another energetic state, n sub j, is equal to e to the negative epsilon i, so that's the energy of the particles in state i, minus the energy of the particle in j, divided by kb times our temperature. And this is per molecule. So if we want to, cons that, that's really only useful to theoreticians, people studying a small number of things. If we want to go to moles, we can transform this on a per mole basis. It looks almost the same, uh, but the, the notation changes just a tiny bit. We have e to the negative e sub i minus e sub j divided by r. So what we're talking about, n sub i is the number of particles in that state, i, n sub j is the number of particles in that state. So we can get an idea of the distribution of states. We're going to look at an example where we can actually calculate the differences in uh, isomers of one another, or conformers. So let's draw a graphical representation of this. So 
So what we're going to do, we're going to have uh, the distribution of states uh, at different energies and different, or excuse me, at different energies and different temperatures. So we're going to start at T is equal to zero, and we're going to go to a situation where we have T is infinite, so a really large value. On our x-axis, we're going to have energy. On our, or excuse me, on our y-axis, we're going to have energy. On our x-axis, we're going to have the number of states. So at a low energy, or a low temperature, uh, there are states that are there, but they're not accessible. So all of our system is going to be confined to one energetic state. And notice uh, there's only one line here. It's not a smeared distribution yet. Uh, as we go, as we're talking about individual particles in this case, and they're quantized, as we go to another temperature, T1, let's say, which is less than T infinity, uh, but is a little bit higher than T sub zero, what ends up happening is, is the number of energetic states become more accessible, and these number, we'll see an increase in the number of states. So there, it could look something like this. And if you notice, there are distinct lines keeping track of the number of states that we had. If we add them all up, they should be equivalent to this, though. Okay, as we go to a bit higher of a temperature, again, we're going to be able to access more states. And then eventually, as we go to a T infinity, the probability of being in any of these states should be equivalent. Okay, but how do we use this information to get something important, something chemical? Well, let's look at two conformers. So we're going to consider uh, methyl cyclohexane. Yeah. Methyl cyclohexane. in one or two conformations, in a possible of two conformations. Where we have an axial or an equatorial. Determine the relative ratio of axial versus equatorial, given the energetic difference between the states, the difference in energy, it's 6.0 kilojoules per mole. And we have to specify a temperature at 300. So let's try to draw a schematic representation um, of these two conformers of one another. So that way we can get something a little more chemical. So there's one cyclohexane. Oops, drawing a looking one. There's another. So at this point, we can have a bond going down, bond coming out. Let's do H, CH, and then we'll do another one here. CH, 3, H. And so it never specified exactly which one is lower in energy, but knowing what you know from organic, uh, you should be able to decipher which one is the lower in energy state. In fact, it should be uh, the equatorial one that is lower in energy. So, uh, if we go back to our original equation, where we had n sub i over n sub j, n sub j was the more stable state. So let's consider n sub a over n sub e, a for axial, e for equatorial, equal to negative e, e sub a 
minus e sub e divided by rt. And why are we going with the mole one? Well, if we look, that energetic difference is in moles. So we have to consider that. Okay, so we have e is equal to negative 6.0 kilojoules per mole divided by our r. So we can look up an r value. We got 8.3145 kilojoules. Oh, excuse me, this is in joules per mole times K, and then we have our temperature times 300. Now there's a problem with what we have right here. Our units aren't going to cancel out. Overall, this should be unitless. So when we look at that, we've got to change that kilojoules per mole to joules per mole. So for every one kilojoule, we have a thousand joules. Manipulate this through, we get 0 0.090. Zero. What this means is, is 9% of the molecules are in the axial position, while the remainder are in equatorial. So this can be kind of useful. In fact, uh, you can use this to look at, all right, if we want a distribution, if we want to increase uh, the number of axial molecules, what do we do? Do we pump up the temperature? Do we lower the temperature? There are things to consider in this case. Okay. So that's a little bit about Boltzmann distributions, but let's get back to what we were trying to discuss, the speeds of molecules in the gas phase. Or excuse me, particles. Particles is a better word to use. Particles includes atoms like helium, atomistic gases, and uh, mono or polyatomic gases such as carbon dioxide. So let's go back to that distribution function, that F of speeds. So it can be shown for a perfect gas that if we're looking at the distribution of speeds, it ends up being 4 pi times m divided by 2 pi r t to the 3 halves v squared e to the negative m nu squared divided by 2 RT. So this is for a perfect gas. Perfect. Gas. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to try to look at this equation. We're also going to plot um, these functions uh, with different ideas in mind. Like how to, so that, that Big M right here, that is a molecular weight. So how does changing the molecular weight and changing the temperature, how is that going to influence our distributions? That's what we're going to discuss. So uh, our y-axis is that distribution function. Our x-axis is the speed, so nu. And we're going to have three distributions. One. Two, and three. So keeping this in mind, what's important is, is this function over here, how does that change this distribution? So that white line, what would need to happen for this to work out this way? Well, we would need a low temperature. Can we see any other way? So we're increasing that we're shrinking this distribution this way but since we have a negative value here if we increase the high molecular weight system then we should pull in more so a high a low t or a high molecular weight will make our distribution more narrow uh, the red the red line that we have that would be where we're trying to expand out as far as possible that would be at um, a high temperature or low molecular weight. And then the orange would be an intermediate intermediate temperature and molecular weight. 
So by increasing the temperature, what we can see is, is we're going to smear out that distribution. As we get smaller, we also smear out that distribution too. So those are things to consider when thinking about the speed. Now, uh, we're going to see this come up later on, uh, but the mean speed... So, uh, the, each of the particles within here has its own individual speed, but usually we care about the mean. The way that that is calculated for any system, B sub n, depending on how many directions or how many dimensions we're going in, is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity, B sub n, times that distribution function, dB. So we're really, oh, D, not B, I'm sorry, that's new. Uh, and what we're really doing is, is we're looking at that volume element and seeing how, how far out do we need to go, and we're getting an average that way. For a perfect gas, it ends up just being a constant. It ends up being 8 over 3 pi raised to the 1 half times root mean square speed for a perfect gas. How do we get that root mean square speed? Well, again, for a perfect gas, that's equal to 3 hat, or 3 RT over the molecular weight, all raised to the 1 half. So those speeds become important. The average speed usually dictates how the behavior of the system is. So hopefully you have an idea of what a Boltzmann distribution is, because it will come back up again. We get an idea of these mean speeds. The lower the temperature, the more narrow that distribution. The higher that molecular weight, the more narrow that distribution. And the opposite is true. As we increase in temperature, we should smear out our speeds more because we're increasing in the number of energetic states that we can access. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below.